Welcome to a brand new episode of Front End Happy Hour. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I've been hearing a lot about module federation lately. More and more companies are adopting these patterns to scale their front end code. In this episode, we are joined by Zach, Zach and Dima from Zephyr to talk with us about module federation. How about uh, the three of you give introductions of who you are, what you do, and what your favorite happy hour beverage is? Uh, yeah, so I'm shiny Zach. Uh, you know, I'm the one with no hair. Um, no, so Zach <laughs> Chapel, I'm the uh, CEO of Zephyr, co-founder, and, um, you know, just here helping to build the organization and all the fundraising, sales, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, my favorite happy hour beverage is actually, um, right now, I do a Jack and Coke. Um, so nice, nice Jack Daniels with Diet Coke, and that, that's my way to go. Okay, so um, I am a CTO of Zephyr, um, many years in this stuff. I'm a Google developer expert in web technologies. That's what I usually drink. I drink right now and will be drinking much later because for me it's like 11 p.m. Uh, we'll be 11 p.m. here in Vidana and I'm planning to go to uh, continue with Rom Cola, whatever Rom and whatever Cola. <laughs> so that's my happy hour drink. Okay, and I would say the let's see. Okay, so I'm Zach Jackson, and I am uh, the creator of Module Federation. Um, also, um, innovation officer over here on Zephyr with these guys trying to you know build this thing up, and uh, infrastructure architect over at ByteDance. Um, let's see, my favorite, my favorite happy hour. I think it, it changes often, but right now it's going to be the Moscow Meal with the Gosling's ginger beer. Got to be Gosling's. Can't be anything else. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, you got to be specific when you like something like that. That's good. Um, and I'm Ryan Burgess, the host of Front End Happy Hour. Before we dive into the episode, I also want to let all of our listeners know, I've heard this many times from you all, that uh, we should do more video and publish our episodes on video. Uh, so in 2024, that's what we're doing. Uh, we have created a YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to subscribe um, at Front End HH. All right. Well, let's dive in. Let's start off with, you know, what is module federation for the people who may have heard of it, not quite sure what it is, maybe excited to try it. What is module federation? All right. <laughs> so the easiest way to, to put it is it allows you to dynamically import pieces of code from independent builds. So normally when you think of um, a build, they're typically monolithic. Everything gets compiled into the one app. And if you say you have a header, um, and you have something else, a home page. you would build them together. And the header portion is probably what? 15 kilobytes of text in the header.jsx file? So now, in several cases, when you work at, say, on a big project, you want to share code, you can either go through NPM, which can sometimes get a little inconvenient to do, um, or you could try to, like, share it somehow at runtime. Um, the problem is, is, often you would kind of see these micro front-end patterns uh, you know, come out. And the whole idea was either, you know, you just have another bundle with the header there and it runs as its own app. Um, but the problem you kind of get with that is you're downloading a bunch of code you didn't need. So this was kind of the frustration I had when I first tried to build Federation. It was really, well, I just want to import the five kilobytes that I don't already have, which is the user code they typed in the header. I have all the other dependencies in my app because we're all roughly the same stacks. So how can I just get the code that I don't have and have that header use all the code I already have for it? So that's kind of the idea between federation. Let's me share dependencies and export feature code similar to how you would do an NPM package, but we can do this at runtime, um, you know, on demand, dynamically. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I think you've described it really well. I'm like, I'm trying to think of anything you missed. I, I expect Zach, you know, creator of Module Federation kind of makes sense that you've uh, been able to answer that once. And I think we can cover some of the benefits too of Module Federation. Like I know something that my team was doing at Netflix was we owned a, a platform essentially that other teams were building and integrating in. And so one thing you could do is like, okay, everyone just, you know, writes code in the same code base. And that's one way of doing it. But 
that's somewhat limiting. There's some teams that are like, well, I want pieces of my application to show up there, or I want to be able to deploy and be independent from everyone else. And so leveraging something like mod module federation made a ton of sense. And it allowed us to really create one application, but have various teams integrating in it. So um, that was one thing that right away that we're like, yes, that's a really great use case for module federation. But I'm curious, what are some of the benefits that you all have seen from leveraging module federation? Well, and I, I can jump on this one too, because there's some fun stuff around like build time, right? If you're building a giant monolithic app and being able to de decompose that into federated remotes, I think that's a really nice thing for a developer screen. Because like nobody wants to sit there and wait for a build. Like Dean was talking about back end develop. Like when I was doing development in Java, like I'd go get a cup of coffee because five, six minutes later, my build might be done. Um, but, you know, with you are like the same things happening too so being able to decompose that into federated modules that you can build independently even if they're all still being built on your machine you know being able to do that independently i think is a huge vx i would say probably one of the big ones that i found is useful for it is it allows conway's law to keep living i mean that, really that's kind of what it comes down to um Conway's law at some point is going to kick in, and not all deployments I would consider equal. And so this is a really big problem when you have a monolithic app is, you know, you want to fix a typo. It's just as much risk as if you were to, you know, go rewrite an API, at least from the product side when they look at it. You got the same rigorous QA, all of this over, you know, pretty much nothing, but nobody's going to let you jump to prod because, you know, you put a space in a, in a word that shouldn't have been there or should have. Um, but... Uh, so with federation, it really allows you to kind of break down the, the categories of how important a deployment is, what can be shipped with less rigor versus what really does require that. And, um, you know, putting everything into a single monolithic application, be it like even if you try to do monorepo and split this up, there is at some point you're going to find some company that has compliance problems. Well, legally, we cannot keep that code next to this other code. Like if you go to the bank or if you're in the government or if you're a company, um, you know, under scrutiny, it's very tricky to just put everything in one place. You need to really be able to control and separate all the concerns correctly. Um, but now if you do that, <laughs> sorry, if you do that, you then have the problem of how do I still like move quickly and work well in it? Um, so, yeah, I would say like. Those are really the big enablers I've seen. It helps to enable the team, but I also do like the pattern that Federation kind of forces you to think in. So I found even with companies, they say, hey, we might want to use Federation, but we don't think we need it right now. I will say, then cool, do monorepo, but pretend it's going to be Federated. So now you don't have these, all these weird cross imports between the monorepo, and it doesn't end up just being a giant sim-linked mo you know, monolith and not actually something that's composable just kind of put some guardrails on it because now, you know, well, Hey, at runtime, I wouldn't be able to do that. So if I pretend it's like that, you generally end up with code that's actually better isolated. So I do like the pattern of it physically separates the damage that can be done to a certain aspect of code. And that's very easy to run wild in when, you know, there's just tech debt everywhere. Like if you're in the old monolith, it's very easy to add more tech debt to something that's got six years worth of tech debt and product doesn't care. And, you know, this is pretty much just a dumpster fire that's eventually going to implode anyway. So why not just keep lathering more on? But if you have a new repo that's nice and clean and it's just header, that header is probably going to look a lot better compared to wherever it would have had to go in before. Because now you can control more of that team, use something a bit newer. You're not necessarily stuck with all the old practices that came in the original code base. Zach, are you saying it's easy enough to to like take that six year old mono repo and then decide I think we're going to want to go module federation at some point and start to like head down that direction, or is it more like hey we have this brand new code base, it's a mono repo and we should start thinking strategically? It's still quite difficult. So I don't I don't know if I've ever done it just like one off and see what happens, but in theory, if you wanted to just do the complete flip. Um, even if you still had like a single monolithic build, what I've done to test this out is I just say, okay, well, for every monorepo workspace, I'm just going to add a new federation plugin onto the main build. So I'll have like 27 federation plugins coming out of one build. And now I effectively have a monorepo at runtime, 
Each one has their own scopes. Each one has their own things they expose. They all have their own package names. And I can import and use them just like I would have been doing in the monorepo. Um, but I think the challenge there is if you take something like that, it's like, well, if there's all these weird crossovers between them, what's that going to do to your reliability and kind of separation of concerns and blast radius and so on? Because I think even with microservice, that's kind of the big reason we try to do it is one, it helps to break down the blast radius. If something goes out, you're not going to take the entire company down, only maybe a certain feature. So inside of your code base, you generally want to try to follow a similar approach. But if you wanted to do a direct port, the experiences would probably be quite similar. But it's more about the you know, building software that's resilient, <laughs> which I no, think we should sense. do in either case. It's just in federation, it's something you want to think about further. But... I've generally found that by doing that, <laughs> you'll end up with less, less of ones because you've generally spent a little bit more time thinking about the unhappy paths of the code. I'm curious. Like, I think we've highlighted quite a few good benefits to leveraging module federation. With anything out there in software development, there's always trade-offs. I'm curious, mm -hmm. what are some of the limitations with module federation that you'd be like, yeah, there, that could still be better, or maybe that's not the right use case to use it for? I, I got one. Um, so that config file and configuration boilerplate and all, everything to go along with that. Um, you know, having to maintain the URLs and the, the providers and, and you know, the, the shared scope and everything that comes with the federated remotes. I think that's been one of the things I've seen in social media and, you know, support requests and all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I, I keep getting this, you know, what is, what is it, the uh, eager fetch, you know, issues around that. Um, I think that's kind of one of the hardest parts so far. Um, but I think those are those are hurdles that are known and that we can work around very easily. Um, especially when you have the creator that you can you can talk to, um, you know that makes life a lot easier. Um, but I think that's that's one of the biggest hurdles. So I suppose that's something we call like dependency management on our end, right? So like for those who have not been like playing around with model federation configuration for each import, like if you want to import a remote, right? You kind of write one line of code on your side of like a component. But again, on the configuration part, you have your production, staging, development, local environments. So for each remote, you have four lines of imports. So if you have like 20 remotes, like some or 50 remotes as some companies, you have a con like a configuration which is like 100 lines of code, just URLs. Then if you are working, and most likely are working in distributed teams, uh, there are fun times to understand when somebody have updated a remote container, when they're gonna bring something on your table which you wasn't expecting to have. Because one of the benefits of monitoration Pros and cons, obviously, is shard libraries, which allows you to reuse not only remote containers, like some piece of code, but actually makes all things smaller. So if you have React, and it's used all over like all of the 50 like containers, you load that once. But then there are like dependency resolution in terms like, we have React 18, 16, 17, and whatsoever, right? And then somebody in some other country actually deploys a new remote, and it uses a different version of React and breaks part of your application. Luckily, you have like React Lazy Suspense, you can like limit, limit the amount of damage it's gonna do, but still it will be interesting to like find a moment of time when there was that change actually happened. Or being able to like, you know, package lock your dependency on the remote container. Because like we get used to some kind of level of uh, control over our dependency thanks to NPM, right? We get used to we can set what kind of updates we want to get or we want to have like package lock we always want to get the same versions until we manually do like bump the versions and do commit for that so we get used to some developer experience and because of the nature of containers that they change over time and they have different environments and different streams of update like obviously you do expect eventually to have a versions available at the same time because it's something like actually requested for and there are other things which i'll like, give word to zach because that's something he loves because people want to want to have more granular control over life cycle events for mode of duration and that's something that can tell even more 
Yeah, I would say, so. I think a lot of the downsides of Federation were around like what I had originally built four years ago. And I had experienced a lot of these downsides as well. Um, and we ended up now kind of trying to resolve most of them that we could. I think there's always an interesting kind of challenge that gets anything in kind of software architecture or anything in this kind of stuff is like, okay, there's, you can do so much to solve the community issues, but you can only do so much at, at runtime with a static build and with no source of intelligence to ingest distributed systems. So I can make the Docker container much, much better and make Docker compose really, really good. But effectively at some point, I'm not going to be able to build Kubernetes with Docker up. Like I'm going to need something else if I'm going to really scale this thing far. That doesn't mean that you can't improve what the containers can do and make a lot of the issues that have existed go away. So I think the biggest thing that we introduced really was the, was a lifecycle hook set up. So it's essentially a way for the user to be able to write small little runtime plugins that can invert the control of what Federation does. Because I know a big one is like, well, it's a black box. We don't know what it's going to do, how it's going to do it. We just know it'll it'll execute. And so introducing the life cycle was really to try and just put some other general eventing on there. Like, so, you know, some of the, my favorite hook that we've added is uh, error load remote. So this is a question we get all the time. What happens when the container is not available? And it's offline. That'll take you, that'll hard crash your application, even if you use a dynamic import, because it's Webpack's runtime checking if the container is there for it to run the factory. And it's not, so it can't go and get, it's not an error on getting something out of the container you asked for. It's the container reference doesn't even exist to begin with. And that causes a hard error. Um, so, you know, things like that. So we introduced error load remote. And now if something crashes, you can return your own module exports of whatever you want. So, hey, if header isn't online, dynamic import a stale copy from NPM and load that in. Or repeat the cycle, and here's a different URL. Try pulling it from the stage remote, or try pulling it from origin B. Or, you know, hey, if you're using localhost and localhost isn't online, then just, cool, go go to the next one, go to the next one, keep going up the origins till you find somebody who's available. Um, another really big one that we had... Uh, so within there also was like dynamic remotes or how do I configure the URL dynamically? I can statically import whatever I want, but nobody really had uh, an idea on, well, how do I change the URL on the fly? So to do that, they would, you know, bail all the way out to like the library mode of Federation, which is more complicated to work with because you have to initialize the remotes yourself. And, you know, it's not very intuitive to work with, but what they really just wanted to do is they wanted to change the URL you know, depending on what the window href was. Um, so they'd have to like over-engineer the solution just because there was no way to do it dynamically. So we've introduced, you know, a series of things like before initialize. So you can set up all the Federation config, who the remotes are, where before anybody starts running. We also have hooks like create script. So if you want sub-resource integrity or a nuance or something added onto it, you can return your own script element and we'll use that to load the remote entry and everything else. Um, another really big one that I think this is the biggest challenge we've had is um, is caching was not able to be deterministic because of the module sharing. I can get React, but where who's going to vend React? I'll get React 18, but I don't know who's going to serve it to me consistently. And that can be a bit of a risk issue for companies where you say, hey, well, your dependencies will be a version that you asked for, but we can't guarantee the behavior between executions. That'll be the exact same branch that ran first. So we've introduced a um, another lifecycle hook called uh, Resolve Share. So basically that allows you to take over the resolution algorithm and you could say, uh, well, we'll introduce a few runtime plugins as well so that you don't have to go and like figure them out. But most of them that I've written have taken like 15 minutes and I can do practically anything that you could imagine. Um, but what, I'm, what, what I want to do is bring out like a Resolve Share plugin just where I'm just using the hook, and then I could say, well, give me your preference. So when asking for React, you should always prefer the host if they have it and it's within range. Or you could create like a common vendor remote. And now everybody could say, hey, if common vendor remote exists, prefer them for loading these dependencies. Otherwise, prefer the host. Otherwise, negotiate amongst yourselves and find an ample one. 
but now you can introduce, you know, full log files of everything. I know you could force it to always use the vendor remote to load React, no exceptions ever. But if the vendor remote isn't there, there's no central point of failure. Unlike, you know, with DLL plugin or ESM import maps or whatever you do, if the resource isn't there, you are done. In this case, it's like, cool, let's just try one. And we can repeat the cycle endlessly until it, you know, finds the right thing, but you're in control of that. And if you don't care about any of that, then don't worry about it. Just use it as you want, and it all keeps working. But the second you need something, you've got a very simple little API where you can, you know, stack these things, and we ship a couple of them as well. So, yeah, I think the runtime API will help with a lot of the drawbacks. I would say the one drawback that still exists will be it's very hard to tree shake shared code. Not exposed code, but shared code. But I think this will, I think... Anything you go into distributed systems, you're probably going to find the same issue. So imagine if you're using like now.esm.sh, no tree shaking. <laughs> you know, if you're going to use import maps, there's not going to be tree shaking. So regardless of how you get shared code, if it's shared, you, you're you going to have a tough time trying to tree shake it. But that's definitely a, you know, a downside, I would say. And it sounds like there's been a lot of flexibility added. Like all the things, Zach, that you just talked about, it's like, okay, here's some of the problems we were seeing. Out of the box, yes, it's going to work, but there are these nuances where you want to have more control. I love the even, uh, you know, trying to find like the, if something's failing, like what what's your fallback? Like that's what I took away from that too, is that you can start to really think strategically about what's that fallback look like. And then module federation is smart enough to say, all right, this isn't working. I'm just going to go grab this, like, you know, build NPM package, whatever it is out there as the, the fallback. So I'm happy to hear that. That sounds really cool. Zach, it also sounds like there's some new stuff coming. Like I, I know module federation is an ongoing project. I think there's a new version coming out. What are some of the things that people can be excited for in some of the yeah. updates? So we just dropped the, the first part of it, which is uh, the enhanced plugin. So if you use Webpack, it'd be at module federation slash enhanced. Looks the same as it always had, except there's a new field called runtime plugins, and it takes an array of, you know, require resolves um, and gives you the runtime plugins I kind of discussed. We also just pushed it into RS pack. So the enhanced plugin is the default in RS pack, and all of this just comes right out the box, which is really great. We are adding, so we have still in the works, we're going to have TypeScript type hint syncing. So you'll have remote type hints sometime this quarter. You'll have real fast refresh and hot module reloading this quarter. Um, let's see, what else have we got on there? We're bringing out a documentation solution. So basically every remote module or every federated component will automatically build its own like storybook code sandbox. And that'll be a side effect of just doing your normal build. So if you just put the, if you just enable module doc, that's the end of it. And it'll just create another remote entry called remote entry dash doc. And they will, um, if you have a way to crawl like all the other ones on the page, so you could use other things in our API or whatever, but you could say like, rotate the page 180 degrees and pull all the remotes connected to the current application and generate like a distributed storybook on the back side of the app. So you could say like, flip it around and there's a storybook where you have a code sandbox of each component, its docs. You can interact with it just like you would with like a storybook or whatever, but all of it's distributed and, you know, um, uh, all, I think all you have to do is just add a .mdx file. So anything that you expose, just put a .mdx and write your mdx and it automatically self-forms it, stitches it all together and everything else. Um, so we have type hints, hot reloading. We're going to have better uh, server support. We're busy working on that right now for... Uh, common JS. We're working on ESM support for the node side. It's a little trickier. Um, I'm hoping that maybe this year we might even introduce import maps. So if we introduce import maps, then with what we're doing to Federation is we're trying to say it's no longer a Webpack plugin or a build plugin. It's a uh, it's a code orchestration framework or whatever you want to call it. It's a dependency manager at runtime that that has compiler plugins that implement its runtime. So like right now, Webpack and RSpack implement the enhanced runtime and provide it with some data. But the rest of Federation is effectively a library. Um, so the idea is, is, well, the only thing really that the bundlers are still giving us is splitting up the chunks and telling us the references of who the chunk is and where and 
if somebody asks for React, it's actually over here and wait for that. But, uh, you know, with how we've designed it, we should be able to replace one piece with a import map bundler runtime and then just say, well, instead of writing to a shared JavaScript object, translate that into an HTML element. So if we did that, then it would kind of provide federation as a, you know, web standard compliant, but much better with bundlers solution. But then, you know, that would give us that agnostic option, similar to what single spa has. And then I know, let's see, docs, there's a lot of things happening, but we've got docs, some Chrome extensions that we use at ByteDance are also going to become public. So you'll be able to kind of see what's going on in there, the topography. Um, in Zephyr, I think there's some inspiration that flows back and forth between the two groups on like how some of these things could work. Cause, um, we also have a very similar setup to, to what Zephyr is. Um, so we'll be seeing some Chrome extensions come out of there. And then one interesting one that just took off now is we're looking at possibly adding a router somewhere in the mix. So saying that Federation could be a full framework if you want it to be of, you know, it's got a router like single spa kind of has that router could feed into our runtime hook. So now when you're saying, you know, before load remote, you could know what the root is, what the args are in the root, all of that stuff, and you could potentially have your module logic gates know your router data as well prior to the app even booting. So I think that'd be very cool to have that look ahead because I've had tons of issues where if I knew where the app was going at startup, I could do something about it and preload it or something like that. But usually I have to wait for JS to kick in and everything to happen. So I think it's very interesting to be able to potentially have the router information before Webpack's done booting up. And you know, like, as Webpack's starting up, it's got a, a router in there that passes into your framework. But, you know, a very, very interesting way to make a look ahead out of it. So anyway, I think that's kind of what we're trying to do with Federation is the way it's been built, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And I think regardless of what you're building with, if you want to share code, the problems are guaranteed going to be the same. So whether you do import maps or street ESM standards, or you're doing bundler magic like we generally have done, the problem is still going to come that, well, when the, when the, the shared module isn't available, how do you recover without crashing the application? How do you, you know, how do you know where to load it? It's always the management of it. It's not really how it's managed. That's the problem. So we're trying to take Federation and push it more in that direction so that, here, cool, this manages code. Whatever code and how it gets it, loading the script has never been the issue. Ten years ago, we could do the same thing. It was managing dead loaded scripts reliably. This is all impressive. Like you're, I'm just like nodding along of all these like really <laughs> cool things that you're adding. Funny enough, one of the things that really got me excited, especially thinking about multiple teams trying to build and work together on things. I mean, I'm just going to say it as engineers, we're often really bad at writing documentation. And that documentation, I think, is really critical in, in these scenarios because you want to better understand what the other team is doing. Like, what is that component supposed to do? And like, what, how's it supposed to show up? And for it to happen more automatically, I, I'm sold, right? Like it's those, you know, easy to forget. Yeah, yeah, I'll get to the documentation. And, you know, you do that a couple of times and it's, you're so out, out of date. But if this is happening behind the scenes, that's huge. And being able to see the whole application that way, I, I'm just, that was impressive to hear. I think that that was something that even my team at Netflix, what we were working on, that was a problem or concerns that we were having as like, how do you keep that all up to date and have the bigger picture of what the application is? So really cool to hear that. I, I would also be curious that you all, I mean, all working on Zephyr, which is, you know, definitely a new, uh, new thing that's out there. I, I want to hear a little more about that. Like what what are the benefits of Zephyr and Module Federation? Like, how, how do they come together? Why would I or companies want to leverage Zephyr? So, uh, when I was speaking about, like, Module Federation, right? right? Pros and cons and mostly, like, things which are hard to start with, right? So, most concerning ports are uh, configuration, dependency management, and where dependency management is, there are version control, right? So therefore, on like the first part, like you need to be able to jump into mode of duration as simple as possible. And let's be honest, there are like two parts, two issues with documentation, right? One issue is nobody wants to write documentation. Another issue, nobody wants to read documentation. <laughs> so like, let's be honest, like uh, 
if you're an engineer, you want to like write two, three lines of configuration and make it run it, right? So that's why we, when I was like demoing Zephyr to you, to you and like there are just one line to it, Zephyr to any application, modification or not, right? It's a great start. Like you have, you do nothing. You get clone, you npm install, build, you have a deploy, right? That's easy. You did it for one application, for another in one repo, and then you have to actually like remotes and the name of from the like next file to you, and those are already connected. Right, you don't have to provide no like shared libraries configuration and no like dependency resolution where it's going to be deployed. You don't really care because that's done for you. Like things which takes a lot of time, but we don't think about it because it's a part of our I don't know like obligation is like create CI/CD processes, create environments, maintenance of those environments, be responsible for like bumping versions and like code review and all the stuff, right? That's actually what we're spending our years of our life on studying how to do develop like properly stuff to actually maintain, <clears throat> which are not super interesting, but takes a huge amount of time. And that's like, we want to solve interesting issues, things which like ChatGPT cannot do for us <laughs> or something like that, right? So that's something which is like developer experience with model fruition should be closer to what we get used to with NPM because like, Back in the days, like like seven years ago, it's actually it was seven years ago when npm was not super popular, like maybe nine already. I'm super old, right? When he was like installing some, like, he was cloning, and you could see two, three, four package managers in one repository, and you have no idea what you have to do, right? So right now, you look in a repository, you see a log file, you see your package log or yarn log or npm log, and you exactly know what you're gonna run. Right, so I want to see same level of, you know, how easy it is to start with model operation. Super easy. Just install Zephyr, add one liner here, one liner there, All, everything deployed, and you have versions. You have your side panel of Chrome where you can switch those versions. You see how updates. You go into application and you can visualize the dependency between model operation because other part of model operation which makes it hard. On one hand, we say like, okay, we are developing distributed application independent parts federated for you on the host but to understand how they are actually connected you have to open each one open configure model federation configuration on each one take a look on like uris you're lucky if it's just uri there could be like delegate model promise new promise this amount of code where you have to find how that's connected understand how that works and then in your brain, build like your graph of how things are going to be connected in runtime, right? Sounds really error prone. So, I think this is this is even an issue beyond just federation not, too. Any distributed yeah. system, the observability and the the the, the ability to see the, the topology of it, even in a standard monorepo, beyond NX, I can't think of anything else that could show me how who uses header. <laughs> like even if or if you had two monorepos. How you header team could not understand where am I used everywhere and what is the spread of how I'm used and in which file am I used across the entire company, thousands of repos, hundreds of repos, or one repo. I want to know the version I'm used at and the very line that I'm implemented on. And you just can't do that with anything currently that I know of, other than maybe um, NX for packages. But as soon as you get into distributed systems, you lose a ton of visibility. And front end just happens to be. A place where you know the disaster can be worse if you can't clearly see what's going on. So, in in but you know this is a problem everywhere. So tackling this is you know I think a big part of it. When well, talking about things that happen, it's the instant blame game too. That something sometimes something goes wrong. So like you know production goes down. Who broke it? Is it the last person that pushed or someone that pushed a week ago and their changes just happened to get in bundled into that deployment, right? So I think that's the, the other interesting thing about like module federation is like a lot of organizations that we see, they're still in a state where everything is evergreen all the time and you have no idea who actually pushed something that broke it, right? And even you combine that with the fact that a lot of people aren't defensively programming and they don't have suspense binders around the remotes. They don't do a lot of those things. It makes it very quick for people to get taken down. And I think with, with Zephyr, A, having that graph of knowing how all the pieces come together 
and then being able to control the versions of each of those remotes independently, understand the errors that are, they're having, the performance implications they're having. I think having that picture finally will make uh, you know module federation together with a lot of stuff coming in 1.5 really ready for your average developer to be able to adopt and feel comfortable with and not require someone who's you know really deep in understanding how separation distributed systems work i think it's going to lower that barrier of entry for a lot of developers to be in the developing and working in this kind of system yeah and i would say even like speaking a bit to zephyr specifically separate from federation i think there's kind of two interesting tracks here because you have Zephyr, which has this great lock file for managing Federation in a deterministic, cache deterministic way. Um, but the the other angle of it is as well, you could probably do, like we could probably make this work with say an NPM package too, because if we can stably manage applications at runtime, switching versions, controlling your shared code, all of that, then you know, doing that at build time is definitely not as open heart surgery as doing it at runtime. So even if you want a monolith, I think still same issues apply. Who uses it where? Is everything in governance? Is everything in the you know place that it wants to be? And do I need 25 tools to try and get an idea of what my application is built of and from? And how can I manage that easily? But imagine going in, changing a drop down and saying, oh, let's use a, you know, newer version of Lodash. And all we do is we just send a webhook and say, whoever this controls just kick off CI again, and you could even use Federation in CI because Node Federation works, so you could actually generate the worker, the workload code to manage it for your CI on the fly, which is kind of interesting. So I see a lot of really interesting opportunities just in making this stuff easier, but I think ultimately, um, at least with Federation, kind of the vision that I'd had for a lot of this stuff is really the build is a side effect, or uh, the, the deploy is a side effect of the build. I don't care about the deploy. I don't want to know it exists. After I hit save, my job is done. I don't want I don't want infrastructure. I don't care how infrastructure works. I don't want to look at AWS. I want to press save and go on and do the next thing. And so I feel like this is all this gets distilled down quite nicely into Zephyr where I don't even I just punch in my key. It'll configure the environments on your cloud, not our cloud, which is I think a really big selling point of it. But other than that, like, cool, if you can compile it, you have deployed it. And now if that deployment is guest facing or user facing or not, that is just a switch on the lock file that we're sending. But effectively, every save press could be, you know, is the same as an ephemeral environment. And, you know, for me, I think that's the dream. I don't care about how it builds. I want it quick. I want it done. And, you know, I want to be able to get things. I want to speed up the feedback loop. And a lot of the feedback loop does not occur locally. I have to push it to a server where there's the right data or where there's QA or to collaborate with somebody. And if it takes me 45 minutes to do a single build, I can my fastest iteration between me and the quality section of the team or whoever wants to look at this, maybe I can do it six times a day, maybe. I like that. There's gives you a lot of flexibility. And just like Zach, I think both of you said this of just... Um, it, it removes some of that, like, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with releases or worrying about that. It's like, I just want to like get my stuff done, see how it works and and move on. Um, I think that's so powerful. It, it just is removing a lot of that complexity. I'm curious too, as, as companies are starting to leverage Zephyr, what are the benefits that they're seeing? Like why, what's compelling to them? I mean, obviously a lot of the things you just said, I can see that, but what are some of the reasons people are like, yes, I need to have that integrated in my system? So I think one of the fun ones is, is something we experienced ourselves using it. You know, so Dima is frequently letting us play with his environment. And, and um, we were on a Zoom call and he was in the process of just adding Sentry. Right? And, and as a developer that's added Sentry before, you know, you have to go set up your environment variables, you know, open a PR, budget, wait for 15, 20 minutes for it to deploy. And then, you know, you'll see it in your environment and then you'll start getting it. And because of the ability of Zephyr to take an environment and bring remotes to it that um, aren't really exposed to that environment, we were able to see what he had just saved on his local machine live on the edge in a staging-like environment and start getting sentry errors almost immediately. And it was 
he's like, I can't go back to regular development. Like everything is instant. I on the edge. I just I you, you go look at another project that doesn't have Zephyr and you die a little inside because it's just not as fun as you know the instant gratification of everything else. And I think that that's going to be something that is going to be kind of addicting to people and it won't be a question of like you know what are you doing today it's like why aren't you using zephyr it's it's like why am i experiencing this pain this conversation um and having to wait for infrastructure having to wait for the you know like changes to get to the point if you get developers used to instant gratification it's going to be a dangerous world i mean we've had lots of that just over the times of even like live reloading it's like one of those things where you're like once you've had it you're like I, I need that. Like, so I can totally see where you're headed on that, Zach, is like you just get used to it and you're like, I don't want to go back to not having it. That's been the experience we've seen with a lot. It's like somebody uses and they're like, yeah, there's just no way I'm going to spend two hours doing what I did in five minutes again. Which I mean, fair. I, once you taste it, I feel like, okay, cool. I just can't go back on it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, I think it's it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting to see what like the bigger user base thinks of it once they get a chance to to try it out. And we're quite excited to see what kind of comes out of this. But I've also found like some other really cool ways to use this because sometimes we found like individuals who don't really want to go all in on federation because they're worried about maybe a business impact or maybe the final performance. Because if they need to share like a they share material UI and they share it poorly. So you get 25 megabyte chunk because it shares all 12,000 icons available. It's like, okay, well, maybe you don't want a mistake like that to happen. I can fully understand that. But I've also been looking at, well, you know, with Zephyr, with the control over the builds like we have, with the new stuff that we have in, in the Federation 1.5 and stuff, I also don't see why you can't use this as a hybrid solution as well. So to go to production, you've got to do an old school NPM publish install, 45 minute loop. But the rest of your development cycle up till time to go to production could all use at runtime linking. Oh, here's the new header, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, when we want to go to production, we're actually going to install the header. Up to that point, we can just stitch the header across the wire, iterate on it, make sure everybody's happy, and speed up the whole development workflow until we get to production and then do one slow, you know, immutable artifact delivery. So I think there's a lot of ways where you can really use the workflow to speed up like the mundane parts of it. It doesn't always have to be all in. But again, you know, not all deployments are equal. So do I really need to wait 45 minutes to see a typo fixed in header for QA? Or could I see that in a couple milliseconds? And then I'll wait the 40 minutes to put it into production. But how all of our CIs are typically structured, everything is the same level of importance. And you're going to have to wait equally, which, you know, I, I really don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Only the important stuff should be behind gates. The rest of it, unless I'm planning to push it to production, you know, it should almost be like on, like, I don't know, intend to merge, checkbox, then all your gates kick off, and then it takes a long time. But until then, just get it on S3 as quick as possible, and if stuff fails, delete it from S3 afterwards. But get it the code available, and let all the quality gates go green, which allows the lock file to update in the right environment. But like in Zephyr, how quick can I get the string on the internet so that you can use it? And then if you're allowed to use it or not in production, all of those are artificial gates. They're not anything that needs to really be done. It's soft gates that, cool, if the unit tests don't pass, it can't go. But if I don't care about unit tests, why do I need to wait for them to run? I only care about unit tests on like the last five commits I make over whatever I'm developing. Then I'll actually look at CI. Until then, I just want to get it up somewhere and look at it. And then eventually I'll actually go and do the cleanup. So, you know, I find that pattern much better. If I don't care about any of this, cool. It won't let me put it in production with anything red, but until I actually want to take it to production. So, like, my takeaway is, like, Zach touched very good topic. So, like, to set up a local environment to work on your feature is kind of, could be really painful. We have seen environments where you have to, like, run five, six repos with Docker is all connected and, like, builds for two hours on the best machine to make a change in, like, to change a text somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And these kind of things like model federation and Zephyr, I don't have to do that anymore because I can run only the part I'm working on. Not even like run, run, like serve on local machine and provide environment variables, right? Because that actually connects to your build environment. So I can actually feed your environment variables for where you're, where you're planning to look at that on a time of a build from like key value storage, whatever. And what is the most important for me, like I work on the part of the code, which actually will fix an issue on the production, but I will have to go through several different environments, which doesn't even have those data, right? 
or I will have course issues. He will try to do that. And with uh, Zephyr and model federation, what I can do, I can just run that stuff locally, not even set up anything like in particular complex how to replace the parts that particular container on production, which I obviously cannot touch from a local machine, right? So, and like usually what would take me hours will take me minutes just to like run a build and like watch build with incremental deploys, which is under a second. And that's gonna be running on production with production data. And I will be able to say that this particular thing actually fixed an environment, which I was, and it's intended to be, not to go through like several stages of something and it will be landed in two weeks when your sprint are done, right? And that's actually like amazing because similar similar level which is actually still not available to everybody. Similar level of developer experience improvement was when we have seen uh, the spread of usage of review environments for your PRs, right? And still not, not everybody use it, but that gives a huge boost for QA. So like if you are able to work in a local environment and deploy to stage environment like, directly, because what they need to do, just say like your combination of remotes and being able to run actually it's like tech automation testing on staging environment with staging data, but with your container without any like drawbacks on performance whatsoever. That's huge, actually huge. And one of the scenarios which I heard like and I enjoyed the most maybe is when people said that when they did acquisition and they do acquisition a lot, right? And they then they spend several years and actually to write that application and the technology to become like to make it a part of like uh, I'm trying to use a word which will not like reveal the name of the like of the company, but like to the common marketplace of the application for enterprise they use, right? Like you buy, then you spend several years. This product maybe not really actually like interesting to market anymore. And then like if we go to like model federation, we are able to inject the first page like in several weeks from now, right? Because we can pick the part make that a separate application, deploy that immediately. And with Zephyr, that's most going to likely goes from weeks to days, right? Because you don't even have to like think about like where it's going to be deployed, how that's going to be orchestrated, how to inject that stuff, right? And this is like from years to days, that's a huge like game changer. It's like, uh, for, from what it was like, if you remember nightly builds when you did a change and then you have to wait overnight and then in the morning if somebody else has pushed something wrong, it's it's the same experience we have currently with like our development and PRs, right? We work with that and like then we are waiting for that. Everybody fix their issue on some range before we go to master. Same thing here. So that's actually something which excites me is the speed of bringing new business value to you, like products without being blocked by the things which doesn't really matter. Overall, they're gonna be running there. You will still have your like green checks and because like each build, each commit has independent um, kind of entity here, even if you're gonna run on top of this change later or you're on to end or like whatsoever, they can be connected now because we are not deploying in a bunch of things. Right, not a bucket, not a zip folder. Each change has its own identifier. So, like, you can connect how your particular work has changed the performance of the UI and how much actually like business gonna get from that, which is great and wasn't simply available before. So that's something I really enjoy to see uh, to become more used. And like we all been, I believe that's gonna be like great developer experience change. So that I'm like working for. Forgot. So a lot of what you all have highlighted, or just like what I hear about Zephyr, it's just like it's it's a pretty big productivity win. Like I, I that's what I see it as. I think a lot of benefits there, but yeah, just being able to get more insights into an application, or even pulling like I didn't even think about it of like a company that has an acquisition of another company or you're pulling in another team like that's a lot of work there's a lot of complexity and if zephyr is able to just cut that down just a little bit that's huge and just being able to pull things together a lot faster and just giving more visibility that's really cool to see now before we dive into picks i would be curious from each of you if if someone's wanting to adopt module federation or maybe a team is wanting to adopt it or leverage zephyr what's a one piece of advice that you would give them? Use NX. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably still dealing with but use NX. Um, yeah, no, seeing in terms of one of the things that we found back when we were doing consulting is 
is leveraging something like NX so you can create generators and migrators and things for your team that bring some of that consistency. Um, no, granted, having Zephyr will make some of that, you know, obsolete. But if you're not using Zephyr, having those like NX generators that will generate consistent applications for your organization, I think is going to be very helpful. And then like you heard the litany of things that, you know, Zach is releasing in 1.5, having, you know, NX migrations to be able to upgrade your stuff from like promise to promise to delegate as opposed to, you know, start leveraging the new hooks and stuff like that will give the organizations that have architecture teams to a, a way to programmatically upgrade all of their, you know, poly repos or their repos and stuff like that. So leveraging NX is a very good way to do that. Um, and also just the guardrails and the and the things that they're building into supporting NX already, uh, Modern Federation in NX already is extremely helpful. I would say uh, don't use the Federation plugin that ships in Webpack. Use the Module Federation Enhanced plugin because Federation is now no longer in Webpack, but the original plugin is still there. However, anything new is not going to be built into Webpack or locked into any bundler. We will be building that under the Module Federation Universe repo. That's the point of truth I would go to. We uh, Federation Enhanced is the plugin where you get the APIs, the slickness, the all the new stuff is going to happen there. It's backward compatible with whatever Webpack has, so they're interoperable. You can mix and match, but if you're starting or you're working on it, definitely go for the enhanced plugin. We pass all of Webpack's tests. We pass all of RSPack's tests, and all of our Chrome extensions, all of our ecosystems will drop in and work with that new runtime API. So, And give the readmes a go, and we'll have a new doc site soon, which should help make things uh, easier to understand and navigate. Um, some of the additions we've made. Yeah. So, like, my third process, I'm even more lazier engineer, it seems. So, I have abstracted away from model federation implementation. So, pretty much, I'm just with Zephyr and depends on where it's used. I have a different implementation. So, if it's like just a client side, I have like in Webpack, I use one model federation if it's an app. If it's like Next.js, it's going to be another implementation. And uh, in the nutshell, I'm going to use with Zephyr. Uh, for just Node.js application and like to achieve infrastructure list. So pretty much like uh, with that for, for me, something like to go with module federation or just a federation of things. Because like when we speak about module federation, that's that's a term which we can, we'll have to change over the time. Because with granularity, which uh, we have as uh, RSPAC with life cycles, that's going to be like, Function federation or components federation. It's not a modules anymore. That's some units of works which we can federate. So pretty much we are able to federate not only UI parts already. We can federate streams or like React servers, com server components, right? Those are not not modules anymore, right? And we are able to cache them on different levels, distribute them on different levels. Like that's a completely new era which is coming here, and there will be in demand tools which makes onboarding to these things easier because let's be honest like i know assembler i was starting with assembler like almost 30 years ago right nobody do that anymore because there are higher level obstructions and like every most people use code pilot because you don't want to spend time on something obvious so like you start with, with zephyr right and then if you need like some super special you like going into like details and then if you, you're going to file model federation enhanced which provides you a lot of capabilities if you need something which is like not something common and but that's like you know you eventually master in the way how you do like model federation it's not that you have to jump into documentation to read all of that so like don't try to you know it's the world when you start with model federation, start small and enjoy the process because there are huge opportunities out there and it's actually shaping up really quickly. And I do enjoy how to see that. So I hope like people should enjoy the journey of model federation because they are seeing a new era in like development. That hasn't been happening for like last ten years. So last big change for me at least was like Docker and Kubernetes and like console like HashiCorp actually push the things for back in quite well. But just think about it. That was 10 years ago. Next big change which happened for kind of UI was NPM and NX. And that was like around like five or six years ago. And like model federation happenings right like right now. So and the thing which 
people should be watching stuff like that. it was released a couple of years ago but it's maturing and this is like a great time to actually to jump on a train and to be an expert which will be in demand and to watch how like how your industry involved. So enjoy the journey because model federation is just starting. Yeah, I think another big one there is like with federation. So one, federations had a good chance to mature. Came out in 2020. We've gotten a lot of feedback on it and contributing back or fixing some of these issues just isn't realistic to do inside a webpack because it'll take weeks to months. So, you know, no. <laughs> but now that we've kind of pulled this out of webpack and made it a bit more, one, easier to maintain across webpack and RS pack now, but the other big thing is, it's cool. Now we actually own the code fully. We don't have to go through a foundation or through somewhere else to try and get any user request added. And it's a lot lower risk to do. But this also means that as we're busy bringing all this stuff out, if you want something, you can ask for it. And we will probably implement it. Somebody asked for, I don't know, there's two hooks I added because users asked for them. And I added them and I'm like, oh, this is actually great. And I ended up using them. So it's a really... um really great opportunity for, hey, if you see this stuff or you have certain challenges with it, we are in a much stronger place to be able to control the direction it goes in. And again, we're trying to move it away from bundler dependence. There's even a pull request open somewhere in here, ESM support for the servers. So once we have that, I'll probably see, well, can with the community, can we look at getting an import map binding as well? And then once we have that, it's essentially that the bundlers are optional extras that produce more efficient, more compatible artifacts, maybe with higher tier capabilities. But if you just want front end and you want something basic, you could do the, the native federation approach, but you would still have lifecycle hooks to control it. And I think, again, it comes down to that is like, well, whatever you do, you need something to manage scripts once they're there and how they're going to come together. So, yeah, if anybody does, you know, if you're looking at it or if you find something that you'd like out of it, file an issue on our Git repo, and it's a lot easier for us to either uh, go in and add this hook or add this capability, or we can kind of walk you through and show you how we would do it. Or thanks to the new runtime plugin thing, a lot of things don't have to be implemented in our core. We can just write community extensions, and the community can control those. I believe somewhere in the future server-side rendering and node support will just be a runtime plugin. It won't actually be a compiler plugin. It'll just be something you add on as a runtime. So, you know, just to give you an idea of how much you can do out of these APIs, it's it's much less a Webpack plugin and it's much more a library that is implemented in, you know, by a bundler for, you know, extra features. Really cool. But you can Here do it you. on your own. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool to hear you all talk through that too because it is like it's something that, you know, has been around, it's still early, but it's been around long enough that it's been more mature, but also there's so much more of that future working out, which is really cool to see. Well, let's dive into picks. Uh, in each episode of the Front End Happy Hour podcast, we like to just share things that we found interesting, share with all of our listeners. Zach, you want to start it off? So something I found interesting, so this is a new venture to becoming a CEO of a startup. So having to learn a lot about VCs and, and investors and being a CEO, because usually I'm not the CEO, and usually Dima's the CEO. Um, so I'm having to learn things. And uh, a good a good first pick is is a book called The Hard Thing, uh, the hard thing About Hard Things uh, by Ben Horowitz. Um, that was recommended to me by one of our, our angel investors. And he's like, you need to read this book so you can uh, learn how to be a CEO and deal with all this stuff. And and so that, that's been a good one. Um, and then also I, I have a second pick, Sheila Jeet. I don't know if you've ever had that, uh, but something I've been drinking that's been helping my focus is, you know, shameless plug, um, Black Lotus Sheila Jeet. It's, you know, a natural rising with the middle. <laughs> Diva's dying, of course, you know, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's one of the things that, you know, help me Don't drink this focus. stuff. We don't drink it. We use it on a yeah. skin. <laughs> yeah, but apparently you could drink it too. Um, so like, it, 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 there's different uses depending on where you're from in the world. Um, you know, it's a it's a red with a bunch of like and stuff too. So like, I've been, I've been drinking it, you know, my little double walled glass rim can. So it's it's been good. Awesome, uh, Zach. What do you have for us? So I guess a couple. Okay, so one pick, and it's not very um, code related, but that's okay. The uh, <laughs> the, the LG. Uh, oh no, not the LG, the Samsung G9 ultra wide monitor, 49 inch one, I think. That is, it's definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. 
So I would totally recommend any of those, anybody who needs to keep a lot of windows open and everything, because it's definitely changed. I used to have two 27 inches, and it's definitely not the same experience as a 49 inch curve. So if you're looking at the screens a lot and you need real estate, I totally recommend an ultra wide. Yeah, I didn't think I'd like it as much as I did, but definitely worked out. Uh, other picks, I'm definitely going to be biased on this. So here we go. As uh, as Chapel like said in the little chat there, uh, I would say RS Pack definitely, or the family that comes from it. So RS Pack is what my uh, infra team has been working on, and pretty much what we've done is we've taken Webpack and we wrote it in Rust, and there you go. So all the power of Webpack with none of the negatives around its speed and uh, you know the challenges that we've kind of seen around getting new code out the door in there, maintenance. So from RS Pack, there's been a really nice little family that's popped up. So if you hate Webpack and you like Veep, then you should check out RS Build, which is a basically like a Veep style build tool configurer that instruments RS Pack. So if you don't like it and you like you want React plugin, you can just pop that on RS Build and you have like a kind of CLI, very, very streamlined experience for working with it. It also supports Federation as well, which is nice. Um, then from there, we also have RS Press, which is pretty nice, which is doc generation. If you need static docs or just static sites in general, it's all a Rust-based implementation. It's what all of our RS Press, RS Build, all of the RS Pack, they all use RS Press to do all of our doc sites. You can kind of get a feel for what they look like and what it can generate. Um, and then this pick I've had for a while, but it hasn't come up yet, but... Um, bundle analysis is a real pain. I'm sure everybody's felt that. If you've ever used Webpack, uh, what is it, the Webpack uh, Bundle Analyzer, it's real awesome. It's showing you very little useful information beyond the files are large and you have problem. So I felt that as well. And usually, like, you know, I think Statoscope is the only thing that I found to be somewhat useful, but it's very, very difficult to use. Um, but what was nice is uh, we are going to be releasing something called uh, Build Doctor. I think it'll be RS Doctor to go with our RS Pack Build Press kind of thing. But it'll work with Webpack as well. And it's essentially going to give you like a ton of information, how long your compilation took, how long it takes to resolve everything. You get a, uh, what is it, the flame chart showing your build time, where all the build went, where the bottlenecks are in your application. Um, I believe it also pulls out type definitions, so you can also see all your type signatures, shows you duplicates, files, basically everything you'd want to know about static analysis is kind of wrapped up in this in this dev tool. So for anybody with a big build, I definitely would say as soon as that hits, uh, totally worth checking out. And that should right land up hoping this quarter. But those would be my my main my main picks. I just have two picks, uh, totally unrelated to this topic, but hey, whatever. Jem and I just had a uh practical engineering management course that released on front end masters um, i'm excited that that's finally out there uh, we recorded kind of at the end of the year last year so it's cool to see it out there it covers topics like you know why become a manager hiring giving feedback building a strong team there's just a lot of in, uh, information in there so i'm excited to see for you know how people take it and then uh, from our last episode, I let a lot of people know that I quit my job and taking some time off. And so in that time, I've been finding a lot of time to fly, fly my drone and take a lot of cool footage. So I thought I'd highlight the drone that I've been using. I had recently upgraded to the DJI Mini 4 Pro. Uh, it's been an awesome uh, drone to fly with. I, I'm a fan of the Mini series for anyone wanting to get started too, because there's just it's light, it's small, but also you just don't have to deal with a lot of the regulations and things that uh, come with some of the bigger drones. So highly recommend checking that one out if you're interested in flying any drones. Thank you, uh, the three of you for joining us, Zach, uh, Dima, and Zach. Thank you so much for joining us. You've shared some amazing insights in Module Federation and brought us up to speed on Zephyr. Where can people get in touch with you? Twitter, Scripted Alchemy. Easiest way to find me. Well, working for the last maybe 25 years. So. <laughs> find me anywhere. Just Google it. The crazy business guy. I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, Zach Chapel on Link Zachary Chapel on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank you all for listening to our episode. As I said at the start of our episode, we are now on YouTube, so you can find us on there at FrontendHH. We're on Twitter at FrontendHH and FrontendHappyHour.com. Any last words? Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank awesome. you for having us. <laughs> great. Thanks for coming. <laughs>